insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 105, Detours Through the Tiki Room. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my insightful and intelligent co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, dear? I'm doing okay. How are you? Pretty good. I'm pretty good. Weather kind of broke today finally, so all that rain was kind of gloomy the last couple of days. Yeah, yeah. So. Maybe the nicer weather is somewhere you know, around the corner. As as we wear on <laughs> through spring here in New Jersey, and yep. the weather will hopefully get better at some point. Absolutely. So on today's show, we will be talking in our Disney Detective. We'll take a look at a concept, the concept art for updates to the Enchanted Tiki Room. And we'll be talking about a place where everyone is welcome. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, or Tales from the Edge of the Room, whatever it is by the time we get up to that segment. <laughs> right, because you never remember what it is. <laughs> uh, we'll be talking about Star Wars detours, maybe finally seeing the light of day. And a heads up to fans of Wedge Antilles, there's a new collectible on the way, pun intended. Mm -hmm. And in our entertainment news, Tony Stark may be returning to the MCU in some form. And official and an official companion podcast for Amazon's The Boys may be launching. And then we'll obviously finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Ready to get started? Sure. Let's right. do it. Let's do it. Go for Disney Detective. So our first story uh, comes from WDWNT.com, and it seems there were some pictures that had shown up um, doing a Moana overlay to the Tiki Rooms uh, for both California and, and Florida. Um, so, you know, basically the question was, is it something where... They're going to be using the area as a meet and greet for Moana, or is it something where the show is going to be updated to be a Moana theme? So lots of different rumors, I guess, going around about this. Um, so the the article talks about that back in June of 2019, they had actually mentioned a rumor about doing this whole overlay of Moana. And it seems later that day on the Disney Parks blog, there was a very um, vague announcement that kind of, you know, went on about rumors about the Tiki Room and, and uh, you know, kind of poking at, uh, you know, some of these other websites that were, were talking about these rumors and basically saying, you know, none of them are true. But yet now, you know, a little over uh, a year later, you you have all this artwork that that's, you know, popping up. Um, so again, nothing's really, um, you know, been confirmed. Um, obviously, right now, you know, if they do that, that's using up you know, area that would normally be for the pre-show. But obviously right now with COVID restrictions and things like that, they're not really doing any shows, you know, indoor or, or outdoor really at this point. So who's, you know, it, it could just be, hey, this is how we're going to use the, the space for now doing, you know, a, a meet and greet as they're starting to, to, you know, be able to do a little bit more, you know, with the characters, uh, you know, for people to go and, and see them. So we'll, we'll see. I, I don't think they'll ever get rid of the Tiki Room. You know, they've tried before in the past to change the theme 
of, of the show and it was horrible. <laughs> And they ended up, you know, kind of putting it back to, you know, towards, you know, kind of the original. So, you know, I guess we'll we'll have to just kind of wait and see on this. So as far as turning it into a meet and greet. <clears throat> so I know the pre-show itself, they kind of have these tiered standing mm-hmm. areas. Right, right. And then you have the audio, audio animatronics that do the show where the waterfall is. Right, right. Are they... Is the theory that that's going to be a meet and greet area? There? Right. That was kind of if you looked at some of the the pictures of the concept art that in front of the fountain would be the waterfall would be where you do your picture for the meet and greet. And I guess, you know, because of the, the curved uh, like standing area. Yeah, the amphitheater. They'd probably have you curve in and out, right. you know, of that to, to go and see, you know, so, so it's, it's not likely they're going to remove the tiki room in favor of a meet and greet. Right. It's just are they kind of theme the room though. That's, you know, that's the idea is, are they going to redo to be, you know, more of a, because there wasn't a lot of talking birds in there that you had the chicken. He didn't really say much. Right. Exactly. So who, who would sing, right. you know, uh, right. you know, so I, I, I don't know. So it's, no dates or anything. on No when dates, no nothing. Happen? And that's kind of what they did. Um, with Stitch's Great Escape. When they closed that ride down, it became a Stitch meet and greet, right. but they were only utilizing the one area of where the, the ride was. So maybe it's just, again, something to use the area for now because it is also kind of an open air area. It's right. not enclosed, and maybe that's what they're looking to kind of use for now until... They but figure, it, it does get very cool there when the doors open, though, which is kind of nice. Yes, and maybe that's what they'll do. They'll keep the doors open during the summer to let yeah. the air conditioning go, uh, you know, through. But they have the fans too, and you're out of the heat also, which right. is nice too, because you're in the shade. Now, are they talking about doing it at both? That's what California the concept and, art and was. Florida? Now, I believe in, in the article, it did mention that wherever they found the, the this concept art, it's actually no longer published anymore. The person took it uh, down. So they don't know if it was one of those, oops, we posted it by accident. But it was actually both parks that they had the, the concept art for. So Interesting. So we'll see. We'll keep our eyes open. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about a place where everyone is welcome. Yeah, so this actually got posted on the Disney Parks blog. Uh, it was also posted on on LinkedIn. <laughs> I, that's actually where I first uh, saw the, the article, and it was on Twitter. Um, and it was uh, a letter that came out from uh, Josh DeMauro, who is the chairman of Disney Parks Experiences and Products. And, uh, you know basically talked about, you know, to all who come to this place, welcome. You know, Walt Disney spoke these words during the dedication of Disneyland Resort in 1955, and more than 65 years later, they continue to inspire us and remind us that the magic we make must include everyone. And it basically goes on and and talks about how um, you know, every cast member, uh, you know, is familiar with our longstanding tradition of the four keys, which are safety, courtesy, show, and efficiency. And they have, you know, been the guide to their approach to guest services for more than 65 years. Um, and that now, after, you know, revamping some things, they have, you know, talked with the cast members and tried to figure out how they could update things. Um, and so now there are going to be five keys and the fifth key is going to be inclusion. Um, and that is actually going to be kind of at the heart of everything. It will continue to guide, uh, the interaction with the guests, collaborate together, create the next generation of Disney products and experiences and make critical decisions about the future of their business. Um, and with this, it, it's kind of, they've already started doing, I guess some of these changes, and this is where the changes kind of fall in into place with, um, you know, doing the reimagining of various attractions to be more inclusive. Um, so the enhancements that we've talked about before for the Jungle Cruise, taking things out that, you know, were offensive to, you know, certain, um, to, to certain, uh, 
backgrounds um and then changing up um splash mountain to include princess tiana um also they're going to be doing something um with the soul of jazz they're going to be putting a, an exhibit together with that so talking about all of those different changes um as well as changes for the cast members as well um they said that they're including policies that will guide how our cast members uh can show up to work their new approach provides greater flexibility with respect to forms of personal expression surrounding gender inclusive hairstyles jewelry, nail styles, uh, costume choices, uh, allowing appropriate visible tattoos and, um, you know, kind of changing, I guess, the look of cast members that, you know, really for the most part has kind of been their staple for so many years. It was really up until not that long ago that, um, you know, male cast members could actually have facial hair, you know, for the longest time, you know, m male cast members couldn't have any facial hair at all. Their hair had to be a certain length and, you know, and, and sideburns and everything. And you had that look and even female cast members had to, you know, no facial hair for no <laughs> <laughs> but their hair had to be, you know, certain colors, you know, you couldn't do like wild purples or anything. It had to be, you know, your natural color and, and nothing to, you know, and, and nail polish. In most cases, you couldn't wear any and then they kind of changed it. So now they're kind of, I guess, loosening it up. And so, so what was the impetus for this? What what drove them to make this? Because you can do all these changes without right. coming out and making a you know, a, a marketing statement like they did here. What? Because they already did a lot of these changes well, before I, making a statement. A right. And, and that's the thing is, you know, is it something where the cast members kind of went to them and said, hey, listen, you know, you're you're making all these changes. You're saying, you know, I'm included, but yet I still have to do this. So it, it was probably an initiative you know, from from a lot of the, you know, the the lower level cast members. Um, so I could totally see, you know, doing, you know, like a male version of a, a of a costume and a female version and then a gender fluid uh, so, version. So obviously we're, we're talking parks here, but does right. it extend beyond the parks to your Disney stores and your your overseas parks. I mean, how far does this extend? Right. Well, and, and that's the thing is the, the four keys were pretty much company wide. So I'm, my guess is that it'll probably, you know, start within the U S and then kind of, you know, expand what was interesting. Cause again, this was posted on the Disney parks blog where of course, you know, everybody can post after it. And, you know, there was a Karen, literally, her name was Karen, um, who said, you know, I go to the Disney parks because that's part of the experience. You know, this way I know who, who the cast member is and who a guest is. If you're going to allow them to just look like everybody else, how am I going to know who to ask for help? Like, they have <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of and then there was somebody that posted right after like come on karen um not everybody walks around in a name tag i'm sure you're still going to be able to tell yeah i mean who, it who's wearing a shorts and a, you know to tell right who's in the umbrella hat and who's you know they don't knock the umbrella hat. Uh, you know what every cast member wanted one every <laughs> time true, we go did. down so they might be you never know maybe that's included in their costumes maybe they'll bring the mickey one back finally there you go that would be you know so it's nice to see that they're you know making some some changes so it'll be interesting to see how it affects you know, the changing and, and, you know, and, and that's where, okay, so what's considered an okay tattoo and what's not an okay tattoo yeah. that like, that's something you, you know, you've never yeah, seen. And that's, I think that's probably the biggest problem they're going to have is a lot of the, f those rulings are very subjective. Right. I exactly. Mean, okay, I can say you can't show any graphic violence, graphic right. nudity or foul language in a tattoo. Right. Okay, well, we can get pretty close to that. Right, exactly. And is it something where, you know, is it, you know, do you have like a full sleeve 
Or is it something where as long as it comes down to, you know, nothing from here and well, on? And or, I you remember know. you telling me about that one Disney fan with all the tattoos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I doubt he would be allowed to even show his tattoos off because they were Disney because of the extent of the tattoos right. they had. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how they, yeah, you I know. Think, I think they're wading into very dangerous territory here when they start making rules like yeah. that. Yeah. Well. We'll see. So we will see. Mm-hmm. So that was all we had for our uh, Disney detective today. Mm-hmm. We'll be back in a minute with Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. Woo-hoo! Got it right this time. You did. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. I wasn't sure if I should go or you should go or, you know, whatever. All right. So uh, our first story is about Star Wars detours might finally see the light of day on Disney+. Plus. So one of George Lucas's projects from the pre-Disney era of Lucasfilms never, that never got to see the light of day was Star Wars detours, which was a non-canon... Uh, take on ordinary life in the galaxy far, far away uh, between the events of Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope. But after years of being mostly finished, uh, but it kind of remained in limbo. So rumors have it that the series might actually be arriving to Disney+. Plus. The Vulcan reporter is reporting that Lucasfilms is finally moving forward with Star Wars detours as Disney Plus seems like an ideal place to drop the complete episodes of the series, which is as which is uh, much more cartoonish and a goofy take on the Star Wars saga, which was kind of aimed at a younger audience. Uh, they speculate that Disney films could make some kind of surprise announcement about it, maybe around May the 4th. Uh, this could even include the possibility that the show could start streaming on Star Wars Day this year. Um, should the rumors pan out, that would kind of be cool. Um, so the interesting aspect of the report is that the show itself actually got more episodes completed than what had been made prior to the Disney acquisition. Uh, so it seems while 39 episodes were completed before the show was canceled, apparently at least additional 13 episodes that were partially animated but remained unfinished have also been finished in the year since the unreleased show's cancellation, bringing the total number of episodes to at least 52. Uh, and according to Seth Green, who I guess he had some part in in all of this, uh, he said that there were actually 62 completed scripts. So it's unclear what happened to those 10 potential scripts. So is it something where they're going to go back and finish them or was it something that are just going to, you know, linger out there? Um, so obviously the fate of the series has been a big question mark uh, for quite some time. Um, some had presumed that uh, the last George Lucas produced Star Wars project had been outright canceled, never to see the light of day. 
Others noticed how Disney renewed the trademark of the series in June of 2018 with some hope for some kind of life for the series that reflected a much different, uh, much less, um, you know, ambitious future for the Star Wars franchise. Um, But then it seemed that in November of 2020, there was a lot of uh, stuff leaking going on that maybe this was going to be, you know, coming back. So it seemed that the decision, the initial decision to shelve the project actually went back to 2013 because of the timing of canceling Clone Wars was going on uh, with that as well. So then, of course, Clone Wars was finished, um, you know, for Netflix and, you know, obviously came back to Disney Plus as well. So there's, you know, hope that maybe this will be the next thing that kind of comes back from the dead, I guess. Um, You know, and what was kind of cool is that you had, you know, Anthony Daniels with C-3PO, Billy D. Williams did Lando, and then you had Seth MacFarlane uh, doing Emperor Palpatine, uh, Al Yankovic, uh, you know, and Seth Green did voice characters as well. So you had a whole lot of people, you know, that were part of it. So maybe we'll we'll get to to see it. I have to be on... Entirely honest with you. You could care less. I could not be more disinterested unless it was a sequel to Solo. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I, om- I mentioned that. I almost I almost put that's, that in. That's why I, I put that little dig in there. Thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not a fan of taking something like that and turning it into goofy. That's why... I'm not really a big fan of the Lego Star Wars things. Like, Mm -hmm. the games are okay because it's for the kids to play, but the Lego Star Wars movies were pointless to me. Get your red flags. Get your red flags here. You like that. There was some comedy to them. But when when it's done as a satirical look at it, Mm -hmm. like the Family Guy one or Robot Chicken one, Mm -hmm. That's different right. because that's that's just somebody making fun of Star Wars because there's so much to make fun of. Right. But when you're the creator of it and you're making fun of it yourself and you're not taking it seriously, it, it's very difficult for me as as a diehard fan to take it seriously at that point in time. Okay. So, uh, I don't know. If, if it doesn't come back, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. If it does okay. come back, I'm probably not going to watch it. Okay. I will mention, though, um, we had talked a couple of weeks back about some of the classic stuff coming in, some Mm -hmm. of the old uh, 80s uh, TV shows. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I saw in that package that I was very pleasantly surprised at was the Clone Wars micro series. Okay. Also came back with it, the Gennady Tarkatov one. It was done in the style of uh, Samurai Jack. Oh, okay. And there were like 15 minute, 10, 15 minute episodes. I think that series was excellent. And it set, it, I think that series was done better than the actual Clone Wars animated series itself as far as storytelling was done. Okay. So, Anybody who hasn't seen it yet, because it was only on briefly and did not make a a return, I would highly recommend watching it on Disney+. Plus. Okay. So next, it's a heads up to fans of Wedge Antilles. (laughs) So Hasbro has made the jump to virtual events this year with the first ever Hasbro Pulse Fan Fest. Uh, It is an event to celebrate the fans with product reveals, engaging content, and uh, premium opportunities. Um, It'll be hosted by Jackie Jennings, and it'll feature updates from all the major brands, including Star Wars, uh, with a panel um, that includes uh, Patrick Snyder, who is the senior manager of global brand development and marketing and other members of the Hasbro Star Wars team. Um, And they, in the article, they actually released a bunch of the different items uh, that are part of the Black Series, as well as the Vintage Collection line. And basically, as long as you don't want Darth Vader, this is everybody else (laughs) 
but there is actually like no Darth Vader, no Sith, no nothing. Um, so you have uh, Wedge Antilles, the battle simulation helmet, which will go for approximately $100. Um, then there's going to be a bunch of uh, three, uh, three and a quarter inch uh, action figures. They're not dolls, they're action figures. Uh, th- I didn't say doll. I said action figure. Thank you very much. Um, you got uh, a Luke uh, in from Hoth, and you got a Han Solo from Endor. Uh, those are going to be uh, twelve ninety nine. Um, then you have some the Black Series, which are the six inch figures. So those are uh, twenty three dollars, and they have a bunch of different you know characters. Uh, one is um, the the tech figure, who's a character from. Uh, the Bad Batch. So a lot of obscure characters, um, you know, for for figures coming out. So not, you know, like your main characters. Uh, so for those Star Wars fans out there who like the obscure characters, this is, you know, going to be your time to, to shine and and buy some some figures now you know a lot of them look like the original you know it, it's nothing um you know like the the luke skywalker and the han solo the vintage you know come you know and then of course there are a couple of newer characters there's a, a character from the mandalorian that's in, included in this um you know so just you know hopefully maybe there's more that's going to come out that they're not showing. But again, it was kind of like, eh. so nothing you have to save your money for because there's nobody that you'd want from this series. But again, you know, we have a friend who, you know, is a Wedge Antilles fan. So here's his opportunity to finally get something awesome, you know, from, from Wedge. Yeah. A Wedge helmet. I guess you could have had a different wedge thing, but I guess the helmet's kind of cool. Yeah, I guess. Uh, it kind of strikes me as, as Hasbro's put out this line of ultra-realistic helmets from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm, okay. So you can get Star Killer, not Star Killer, um, Star Lord. Oh, okay. You can get Iron Man. They just so released this is probably, Ant-Man, so it's probably okay, along of the, the same, same line. Okay. I could see you that. Know, kind of like the force effects lightsabers that are ultra realistic. That's sort of right what because are. they're battery operated with sound effects and things right. like that. So, all right. right. So, that's kind of cool, I guess, if you're into that sort of thing. Right. Again, nothing that you have to put your money away yeah, for. This was kind of a lackluster. Uh, yeah, I kept like, from the edge of the galaxy. Sorry. This week. <laughs> they can't all be, you know, big giant Darth Vader y ones. Well, they can. We just have to find them. Okay. Yeah, I know. Anyway, that was all we had for our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy this week. We'll be right back with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Dum, 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 dum. Go for entertainment news. <laughs> so uh, from WeGotThisCover.com, uh, it seems that Tony Stark may be reportedly returning to the MCU, but as an AI. So 
excuse me, obviously one of the downsides of playing one of the most recognizable and popular movie characters of the 21st century is that when you finally decide to step down from the role and retire gracefully, everybody expects you to make a comeback. So obviously Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark may have bowed out of the MCU after sacrificing himself for the greater good in Avengers Endgame, but almost as soon as the credits fade to black, the rumor mill started churning about a potential return. So the actor has, you know, said time and time again that he was done with the part, but that hasn't stopped him from being linked to literally dozens upon dozens of future MCU products, uh, projects. So, you know, obviously one of <laughs> your favorite insiders, <laughs> Grace Randolph, <laughs> we've mentioned a number of times is claiming this week that Stark will be returning to the MCU to voice an artificial intelligence. And though she doesn't say when it'll happen, it's still one of the most uh, plausible ways to get Downey Jr. back into the franchise without compromising the narrative of Endgame's finale. Um, so obviously there are plenty of precedents for this kind of uh you know, MCU got, you know, uh, path to follow, excuse me, because you had, you know, Paul Bettany, who was, you know, a disembodied presence before becoming an integral part as Vision. So you have Armor Wars and Ironheart, which are on the way to Disney Plus. And so the thought is that they are going to be using Tony Stark's voice to be part of the storytelling and, you know, the AI of things in the future. So it's plausible. You could see it happening. You know, if Grace was a baseball player, <laughs> she would have been benched and sent to the minors a long time ago. I was waiting for that. I, I don't know what she's inside of, but her <laughs> level of accuracy is, is really horrendous. Mm. So we need a scorecard for her, really. I think, go. I think it's certainly a plausible storyline. Mm -hmm. Um, I think more than likely what he probably may have been involved in was coming in to do some voice work for some of the Avenger, uh, campus projects True. or video games mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, I can that, see that. That he still, you know, exists in. Mm -hmm. uh, I doubt we're going to see him come back into the MCU, but you know, she might get one, right? see it being more of the the Disney Plus side of the MCU things. Um, you know, the the one show um what if Right. I'm sure he's going to be right. part right. of that. And that's the because, thing. The, the projects that are not canon projects right. are what he, he's most likely right. to be Right. And so in. I could see that. Or, again, some of the smaller things. I don't see him showing up in any of the big movies. Right. I could definitely see some of, you know, like you said, some of the smaller. No, if anything, you're, you're probably going to see a Chris Evans do some kind of cameo or return or something like mm -hmm. that for a, a proper handoff type right. thing. Which we've been waiting Especially for. Especially the so, way yeah. that Falcon and Winter Soldier has been going. Woo! Which we haven't done a, an insightful pick yet. No, on, so you haven't. After last week's episode, I, I'm comfortable doing it, but not right. this week. <laughs> I already have one this week. Right. So we'll save it for, for next. So. so let's talk the boys. Yeah, so this was kind of interesting. So in addition to the boys receiving both a third season and a spinoff, which I didn't realize, on Amazon Prime, the hit superhero show is now getting a companion podcast, which is actually going to be launching today. Um, it's called The Boys, the official podcast, and it'll take a deep dive into the development of the R-rated Cape series. In addition, uh, in total, I'm sorry, eight episodes will be produced for the show featuring chats with executive producers as well as the entire cast of the show. Um, they said, we're always playing with the thought uh, uh, with the thought experiment of if the boys were real, if superheroes really existed in the world, how would they affect everything? Uh, and then from there, you try to be as absolutely logical as you can. So in addition to those that are in front of the camera, crew members will also be featured on the podcast. Uh, they're going to have costume designers, um, FX supervisors, stunt coordinators, uh, and directors as well. So it's kind of going to be, you know, a uh, soup and nuts 
uh, crew uh, that's going to be there. Uh, so again, the shows will launch with two episodes today, and the remaining six will debut weekly throughout the finale on May 27th. Obviously, the podcast will be available wherever you listen to podcasts. I've heard that before, along with Amazon Music, Apple, and Spotify. Wow. It sounds like our own commercial. <laughs> um, so obviously the season three uh, for the boys hasn't been, they haven't released a, a date yet for that. Um, but obviously the first two seasons of the show are already available on Amazon Prime. So it's worth pointing out that this is why we couldn't get any of the stars of the show on our podcast. Right, because they were already working because on Because they were else. already working on this one. That explains you know, it. I couldn't, I couldn't get a proper answer to Yeah, to nobody was calling us back, yeah. So at least now I know they weren't just <laughs> snubbing us. They had their own project that they right. were working on. So maybe on. because we plug them, maybe they'll be nice and plug us. You never know. You never know. You never you know. Never know. know. I'm willing to sell <laughs> advertising on the on the show too. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> so that, that's all we had for our entertainment news. Mm -hmm. We'll be back in a minute, less than a minute, with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick happened to be a documentary uh, on Netflix, uh, and what was kind of sad was I actually started watching it before Prince Philip passed away. Um, so it's uh, the documentary is Elizabeth and Margaret Love and Loyalty. Uh, and the documentary came out in uh, 2020. Um, the documentary takes an intimate look at the complex and widely misunderstood relationship between Queen Elizabeth II and her sister, Princess Margaret. Um, and it's interesting because it's a lot of behind the scene um, photos and, and vid, uh, you know, film of, of the two of them and kind of talks about, you know, how their life started with, you know, them being princesses but not being in the limelight because their father wasn't, you know, at first, you know, he was second in line for the throne. So they had a very carefree life. Uh, when they were younger, um, and then when their uncle decided to advocate and, you know, their world kind of turned upside down, you know, overnight. Um, and really, the two of them were each other's best friends because for the longest time, it was always just the two of them. Uh, when the war broke out, they were sent off for years separated from their their parents it was just the the two of them uh so you you saw that they had you know it was a happy childhood but you know obviously kind of sad in in other respects and that they were always you know again both were always together and then she met philip and she got engaged and then it kind of it didn't really m make a rift between the two of them, but it, it kind of did. And then, of course, you know, the the untimely death of their father, where now all of a sudden Elizabeth becomes queen. So now it's no longer we're sisters. It's I'm your queen. You're my subject. And how their relationship kind of was strained at that point, and it's interesting because, again, we've, you know, one of our favorite shows is The Crown. So a lot of the stories and a lot of what they were talking about is stuff that they've shown on The Crown. So it was like, okay, yeah, I knew about this. I knew about this. And, oh, here's the little twist of, of this. And, you know, at one point, you know, there was a rift where, you know, they kind of were not really went their separate ways because they were always still in each other's lives. But then kind of towards the end of Margaret's life, she kind of came back into the fold and started doing more for the crown because she had kind of stepped away for a while because she didn't want to be part of it. But then she kind of came back and filled a lot of her 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 royal duties that she had stopped doing for, for a while. Um, and it kind of brought them back together again before she passed away in, in 20, uh, 2002. Um, so, again, it kind of interesting to see. And, you know, obviously the crown hasn't caught up to that part. So it'll be interesting to see how the crown 
uh, takes the, you know, that spin on on things. Um, but it was, you know, very well done. And so if you're a fan of The Crown or fan of, you know, anything with, with the royals and you're looking for, you know, something to watch, highly recommend it. Good pick. Thank you. My pick this week is not a documentary. It is actually a show we just started watching. We're two episodes in. Two episodes in. And that's The Irregulars on Netflix. The Irregulars is a British crime drama television series developed for Netflix specifically. So it's a Netflix original. Based on the works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, it features the Baker Street Irregulars working for Dr. Watson, Saving London from Supernatural Elements. Created by Tom Bidwell, the eight-episode series premiered on March 26 of this year. Set in Victorian England, the series follows a gang of troubled street teens who are manipulated into solving crimes for the sinister Dr. Watson and his mysterious business partner, the elusive Sherlock Holmes. As the crimes take on a horrifying supernatural edge and a dark power emerges, it'll be up to the Irregulars to come together to save not only London, but the entire world. The show itself is really a mix of Sherlock Holmes, Carnival Row, and Doctor Who rolled into a show with a unique look and feel all in, uh, in and of itself. Uh, they capture the classic Victorian London with images ripped from a Dickensian novel and throw in a modern soundtrack to highlight the action and you have a perfect blend of genres. It's part murder mystery, part horror story, part drama, and part comedy, all perfectly balanced to keep you interested, invested, and in coming back for more. Uh, I was very surprised at how quickly I took to this show. Because mm -hmm, I was the one that heard about right. it and I was like, ooh, and then I saw the trailer and I was like, oh, this is something I'm definitely going to like and I was going to start watching it without you and I was like, watch the trailer, see if you want to watch it. And you were like, eh, all right, I'll give you a try. And after the first episode, you were like, it, it grabs okay. you from, <laughs> unlike the current uh, line of Marvel TV shows that are on Disney Plus. This one grabs you right mm -hmm. from the beginning. Yeah. Pulls you in and makes you part of the show. Mm -hmm. Um I don't think I don't think I've had that effect since The Boys. Right. Because The Boys does the same thing for you. <laughs> boys me. does that within like the first um, two minutes. <laughs> so I was very impressed with it. I was I was very impressed because it's a it's a very young cast. Mm -hmm. And I was very impressed with the talent that they mm -hmm. show, the the acting uh, the camaraderie that you see. I mean, you, right. you immediately get invested in these characters within the first 10 minutes of the show. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's hard to capture that. Right. Very few shows today can capture that. Uh, so very impressed with, it. I look forward to seeing the rest of it. I did see they do, they did get approved for a second season. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, so, so that'll be good to very, very look pleased to. to see that. So the irregulars on Netflix and we'll be right back. So I think that was it for the show today. I did have one little side oh, note. Oh, see, you didn't. Did you, threw, oh, you threw it in at the end. Like, I didn't even know you put it in there. Ha. Ah, well, it was nothing. I don't nothing, have a link for well, it. Well, so it was I nothing to because it was an email. It oh, wasn't, okay. you know, I'm sure if you go to the website. Um, yeah, it was late this afternoon. An email came out about Keystone Comic Con. And that was one that we had gone to two years ago. And we really enjoyed and were hoping to to go to it again. And unfortunately, with everything that happened last year, they were ones that came out and said, OK, we'll see you in 2021. You know, stay safe, blah, blah, blah. So unfortunately, they sent out a letter saying that earlier this year, we announced dates and a timeline for our 2021 events. But as you've noticed, something's been missing from the list. They said we were hoping to come back to, you know, for a third year in Philly. Um, but with, you know, doing, uh, you know, everything that's going on, it's not in the cards. Uh, so they said while they won't be returning for 2021, as the world starts getting back to normal and things stabilize, we hope to bring it back in the future. In the meantime, in the spirit of 
uh, event alive. We continue to connect with all of you through our virtual initiatives at findthemetaverse.com. You know, they say to sign up, to get newsletters, and hopefully, you know, something will be coming, you know, later on. So that was kind of, you know, not unexpected, but, you know. So your your news was, we're not getting it. <laughs> like, it would have been different All if right. they were coming back with it and gave us something to look forward right. to. Oh, uh, well. Hot off okay. the presses. Da, 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 da. Sorry. That's okay. mm. All right. Anyway, uh, I think that's all we had. Before we go, I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get video versions of our podcast if you look for Insights into Things, audio versions of this podcast. You can find us Insights into Entertainment. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Amazon, and any place else you can get a podcast. I would also invite folks to uh, – Write to us. Give us some feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We stream six days a week, except right now, because apparently we just lost our internet connection. So I was streaming, but I'm not now. Whoops. But we typically do that six <laughs> days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insightsintothings. If you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you do get a free monthly Twitch Prime subscription. We would appreciate it if you threw it our way. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. We are on Instagram at insights into things. You can find the audio version of all of our podcasts at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. You can get high res versions of all of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. And if you missed any of those links and not sure where to go, you can go to our main website that has links to everything and it's insightsintothings.com. And I think that's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.